Evidence-informed policy making is increasingly being acknowledged as a critical process to promote good policies through the use of authenticated high-quality evidence. It is an approach to policy making that ensures that policy decisions are well informed by a broad range of the best available evidence. For Zimbabwean policy makers, development practitioners including other non-state actors to meet the national challenges like poverty, high unemployment, dwindling health service delivery, growing youth populations among a host of others, they need sound credible evidence to inform their policy decisions. For policy makers to use evidence, there has to be an effective link between the research side and the policy making side, including an enabling environment of engaged stakeholders. It is an apparent axiom that research evidence plays a very critical role in ensuring that policies are not only responsive to people's needs, but actually address these needs. To quote the words of President Uhuru Kenyatta when talking about the role of research, this is what science, research, technology and innovation should do, meet the people at the point of their greatest need. In Zimbabwe, the evidence-informed policy-making approach is still relatively new, although some policymakers have started to increasingly talk about it. A policy is essentially um, a response by government to the challenges or the opportunities that citizens face. So, it is important that government is very well informed on what is happening on the ground. You can only be well informed if you either undertake an assessment or you undertake very credible research so that it informs how you respond to a challenge. In research, there's a big emphasis on objectivity, that we don't arrive at a question or a problem with an outcome in mind because then we taint our results. In research, we emphasize that let the facts be the facts and then act accordingly. That's the first bit. The second one is that we emphasize that there must be a clearly documented process from where you start to where you end. Uh, normally, policies would be formulated because of a need, uh, certain um, maybe realities, certain conditions that exist that would need to either be uh, discouraged or to be promoted. So those conditions would need to be known as to what, what are they. And in order for them to be known, research has got to be conducted, uh, empirical research to get empirical evidence. The first and foremost is the process whereby the policy has been evolved, formulated, implemented, and the assessment of the impact of that policy. That creates a complete process. Every policy formulation and implementation must lead to an improvement of the quality of life of the people. So that must be the key determinant of policy formulation. Well, policy making is one of uh, the duties of a parliamentarian, both of basically three duties, um, making laws, which is policy, and a representative role, which is representing your constituency in parliament, and also oversight of government through a portfolio of committees of parliament. Now, uh, involvement in policy making is through making of laws in, in parliament. Because what happens is that uh, government should bring legislation for amendment to parliament, and uh, members of parliament discuss uh, the legislation. And uh, when it is um, fit for passing, we, we pass it as a bill and then it is um, sent to the president for presidential consent before it becomes an act of parliament. Inclusivity and civic participation is the hallmark of democratic policy-making processes. The policy-making process should be open, inclusive, transparent, evidence-driven, accessible and responsive to all citizens irrespective of social, political, cultural, religious or other inclinations. This will result in a diverse number of voices and views in the process. Inclusivity is a quality that should be observed at every point of the design and delivery of public policies and services. Inclusivity promotes transparency, accountability and public participation. 
through consulting and working with citizens. Civil organizations, businesses, and other key players, governments are able to achieve positive policy outcomes and improve public service delivery. Now, how inclusive is the policy-making process in Zimbabwe? Uh, from the perspective of academics, uh, they are attempts certainly. Right now, the government has been going through universities to get academics to uh, organize themselves or rather to be registered as part of um, collective think tanks. So they've asked academics to say what are the expertise, what are their research backgrounds, so that in the event that some expertise is required, they can quickly go into these institutions. However, again, I think more needs to be done still because there's a crowding out of, uh, of voices that you often find. And I think you, you, you find this mainly even in the, in, the, in the media, when you read newspapers or you listen to radio, that it's, it's the expert voices that are often the most um, muted because they are not sensationalist. So I think government can really take an opportunity to really emphasize that they are basing their decisions on expert opinion. I'm afraid uh, the government is generally not inclusive in formulating policy. There is a belief, I think, because government ministers are the ones that lead in the executive. Unfortunately, um, I will say in Frank that they are very, a lot of the time they are very arrogant. They do not necessarily maybe espouse the, the value of servant leadership. A lot of them will just dictate positions and come up with their own ideas and expect everybody to then follow. It's like putting the cart before the horse. Uh, every now and then you might find some consulting, holding public consultation meetings and stakeholder meetings, but it's rare. And then usually when those stakeholder consultations are carried out, the, the outcomes and the, of those consultations hardly ever see the light of day. They don't get reflected in the policy because it's very rare, very, very, very rare. There's, there's no separation of powers. Parliament is a lame duck, largely. You know, you heard people complaining that ministers don't come to Parliament. And um, even the process where policy is made, it's not hardly in cabinet nowadays. Ministers see the president separately, get the issues see cleared, and you can see the contradictions over the indigenization, the two Patricks fighting it out in the same cabinet. But, uh, before that, Mchangwa and and uh, and uh, Shinamasa on one occasion in public, you have seen uh, agreement among ministers over policy policy issues, competing for turf and so on. So it's confusion, Con confusion, contradiction, lack of consistency, uh, and therefore that affects the policy framework uh, overall. What we have seen over time is that government has um, really tried to be more open in inviting civil society to engage with it on key national issues. So, for example, when you look at, at, at the gender policy, the last gender policy was adopted in 2004. When government decided that they needed to revise it, um, which I think was very prudent because a lot of things have changed since 2004, including our new constitution. They invited a, a number of stakeholders to be involved and we played a key role by making a direct input into the revised policy. And what we've also seen, because we've worked closely with the ministry, is that at every opportunity they will present the key issues that are emerging and that are in the policy because at this stage the policy has not yet been adopted, the revised policy. So they will present those issues at, at different fora so that they can solicit uh, viewpoints. What I'm not so sure of though is whether government um, decentralizes the consultation process because we as civil society, we have an MOU with the ministry. So because we have an MOU with the ministry, it is fairly easy for us to have access to the ministry in terms of engaging with the ministry. But we are not sure whether, um, you know, if, if you were to go to Churumanzu or you were to go to Mutoko, you would find that, you know, the ministry is consulting with the people on the ground. Then if it's not consultative, you lose out on the people and you lose out on implementation. 
and I'm sure some of them would have done better with more consultative uh, talking to the people, making sure that once it is there, everybody embraces it and moves around, moves together with it. When people are aware why that policy has been put there, they obviously follow. And when people follow, you move together. And when you move together, you get results. The president goes to a rally and he announces a 10-point plan. And you say, what informed him? Or Jonathan Moyo and company ahead of the 2013 election uh, couple up uh, ideas and baptize them Zimasa. Uh, policy making has been very much, as I say, on a gut feel, on a hunch, on a common sensical basis rather than on a I'm a bit unhappy with the um, the way policies are made in the, in the country because policies are made and then they are shoved through the uh, through people's thoughts. I think what should essentially happen is that uh, they must be um, uh, people must be consulted, and that is why you have a parliament. Parliamentarians must go and consult people first, and uh, after consult, consulting people, bring um, uh, what people have suggested in parliament, and then policies can be made on the basis of that. But if you look at some some laws that have been opposed by Zimbabweans, a typical example is the indigenization uh, law. Um, it was promulgated um, quite a long time ago, um, and and now it it is being it is being implemented. Um, people have opposed it because um, the feeling is that it is not a law and the policies are such that they cannot um, attract foreign direct investment. And the economy, this country's economy, what it needs is foreign direct investment for it to start, uh, to start kicking. And indigenization is a, is, is a piece of legislation, is a piece of law that, um, that flies in the face of um, foreign direct investment. The government has recently been in the spotlight with criticism aimed at its failure to implement seemingly good policies. Most analysts feel that Zimbabwean policymakers formulate very brilliant policies and that Zimbabwe is said to have formulated very good policies over time since independence. However, with the exception of a few, most of these policies have not yielded any tangible positive results. On the other hand, some policy analysts don't agree completely that Zimbabwe is good at policy formulation as many seem to suggest. This school of thought feels Zimbabwe's policy failure on implementation is as a result of failure in formulation. Sometimes a leadership that is not uh, genuinely committed to the interests and needs of the people and uh, they come up with policy just to save face, to produce it and to put it in, in front of you and say, this is what we have uh, planned. But uh, when it comes to really uh, implementing and making sure that there is a service, there is a, what is enshrined in that policy uh, implemented, there is very limited commitment. And sometimes there are not even resources to make sure that the implementation is successful. Some positions are masquerading even as policies, and they're not necessarily policies, but they do have the effect that they have no bearing to, to, at all to reality and to the facts on the ground, so you can't implement things like that. What we have noticed over the years is that our government is very good with um, developing policies. Um, maybe I can just speak from the perspective of um, a, a response by government to gender equality issues. I would say that um, from a policy standpoint and in terms of the frameworks for all strategies for delivery, they are there. The challenge is the implementation. There is a gap between policy and implementation. And there are a number of factors. But what we have seen is that, uh, for example, with the gender equality agenda, uh, the amount of resources that are going towards implementing policies is very small. And it is something that we have raised over time to say that um, government must have a policy, a very clear policy, of ensuring that they are budgeting from a gender perspective. So that on an annual basis we know that this percentage of money is going towards implementing gender programs. The UNDP published a study of global practice contrasting 
policy making, policy formulation, and policy implementation. And Zimbabwe featured very highly in the ranking of policy making. But we sat at the bottom of the rank in policy implementation. I don't know that I have a complete answer to why, but I think because our policy making process is so simple, ultimately it ends up in an announcement or pronouncement by a minister, by the president, or a statement in parliament. It's very easy to make policy. But it's more difficult to implement because implementation now requires a strategy, now requires resources, now requires capacity and competence, part of the resources. And you cannot always match the policy articulated with the requirements for implementation, especially in terms of material, financial resources and human technical resources. As long as we do not have the rightful people in the bureaucracies, we lose out. Some of these things go down the cracks and we never really get the results which we want to get out of those policies. So yes, Zimbabwe, we have no problem of coming up with policies, wonderful planning policies, but hey, we need implementation. We just need implementation. Because honestly, if these policies which we have come up with from independence up to now are properly implemented, we have no reason to have to be in an economy like this. So what role does evidence play in policy making in Zimbabwe? Are Zimbabwean policies evidence informed or reactionary? It is not in the interest of the people, even if it's reactionary. It is uh, uh, mostly and oftentimes an attempt to either protect power or to gain power. That is the main motivation of the police formulation in Zimbabwe. And uh, sometimes it is to protect the interests of those in power in terms of um, the resources that they've gained or the opportunities that they continue to enjoy. As a, as a person who has studied or looked at this not from an insider as a policymaker, I would say that many of them seem very reactionary. Uh, and that's evidenced by the fact that you look at the time horizons we, we, we use. Uh, right now there's a big uh, agenda for the next uh, 40 years on the, on the continent. And I think our policy should really be looking at that sort of horizon with, with research designed to say where do we want to see Zimbabwe at that point. And then we are then more proactive in addressing issues as they, as they come up. Certainly since 2000, there's been uh, the priority or the primacy of national security has taken over at the expense of social economic policy imperative. We can see this in the, in the budget allocation, for example. The security ministries, including the office of the president and cabinet, takes almost a billion dollars, 25%. And when you look at the the overall budget, where 83% of the budget is on salaries, there's a remainder, maybe 7%, 10% on development policy issues. The highest budgets are defense, home affairs, and the office of the, of the president, apart from the health and education. But again, those figures I have to do with salaries rather than developmental issues. Over the last three years, the Zimbabwe Evidence Informed Policy Network, with support from its partners in the Vakayiko Consortium, has been supporting the government of Zimbabwe in building its capacity to use evidence in policy making through capacity building training programs and various stakeholder engagement interventions like policy dialogues and evidence cafes. What we've been doing uh, is ZipNet We've been trying to build the capacity, uh, especially of those who work uh, directly with policy makers. We have been trying to build their skills uh, so that they are able to effectively access evidence, you know, assess it for authenticity and credibility, uh, and also uh, package it in a way that is communicated in a form suitable for policy makers. As a consortium, we've actually developed a toolkit 
uh, that addresses uh, knowledge and skills. So we have actually piloted it uh, in a number of uh, public institutions in Zimbabwe. The Parliament of Zimbabwe working with the research department. We have also worked with the Ministry of Industry and Commerce, including the Ministry of Youth, uh, in trying to uh, build the capacity of people working uh, in these institutions so that they effectively engage with research evidence and also uh, articulate and use it, use it to inform policy decisions. Uh, we have not only focused on formal institutions only, but we have also gone as far as to engage, you know, even the ordinary people uh, in ensuring that they also participate in the policy making process. We have done this through uh, what we are calling evidence cafes or knowledge cafes. We also try to demystify certain scientific esoterics uh, so that. Uh, ordinary citizens can be able to understand, you know, science, especially on those topics that also have a bearing uh, on policy. So, uh, in short, uh, we've uh, done so much in terms of uh, building uh, knowledge and skills and also engaging stakeholders, including the creation of networks uh, and linkages between the various stakeholders in the whole matrix.